What we're going to talk about today is how the epilepsy uh, experts of the world just decided to change all the terms and how we uh, classify and describe seizures. Uh, there have been a couple of changes in the last 10 years, and the last few changes were terrible. They weren't well accepted. They used words that didn't make any sense. So the alleged experts got together and they came up with a new way to describe seizures. And I think they got it right this time because this system is a little bit clearer. Uh, they think they've got it right and they're tired of changing because they have disbanded the classification committee. So I think we're stuck with this classification for the next uh, few years. Um, so we're gonna talk about that classification system. And then we're gonna briefly talk about the general treatment options and the goals of treatment, uh, and then we'll have a discussion. And I hope we'll have plenty of time for the discussion. So this is the technical World Health Organization worldwide definition of a seizure. So you can read it, but the two key words are seizures are sudden and transient. They happen and then they stop. And the symptoms can be motor, movement, stiffening, shaking, sensory, a feeling, autonomic, that means a change in heart rate or blood pressure, or your pupils get big, or you sweat, or psychic, which means you have a feeling, or a deja vu, or an experience. So it's obvious that seizures can be almost anything. But the other key thing, about this definition is that not everything that is sudden and transient is a seizure. There are other bona fide medical things that are sudden and transient that are not seizures. A headache, a migraine headache, a fainting spell. Those are two, three common things that are sudden and transient that are not seizures. But here's the twist. Some patients with epilepsy also have migraine headaches and also faint. You can have both, or you can have fainting or migraines that are misdiagnosed as seizures. So just because the symptom is sudden and transient doesn't make it a seizure, but if it is a seizure, it can look like virtually anything. Most seizures and all focal seizures, we'll come back to the word focal in a second when we talk about classification, but I'll just tell you now that focal is the new word for partial. All focal seizures start somewhere in one of these lobes. So this is, the, this, is, this is the brain, this is the upper part of the brain, this is the part of the brain that makes us humans. Um, there are four lobes. Focal seizures start somewhere in one of these lobes, in a spot. So we'll come back to that in a second. Now, once you've established that it's a seizure, the next question to ask medically is not actually what type of seizure was it. That's the next next question. The next question is, was it provoked or unprovoked? A provoked seizure is not epilepsy. A provoked seizure is a seizure, but it's not epilepsy. And the key to a provoked seizure is the word immediate. It has an immediate trigger in the moment. And the most common reason for a provoked seizure uh, is actually in children, and that's a high fever. But there are other causes like head trauma or infections of the nervous system. But the key to provoke seizures is the seizure is an immediate consequence of that trigger. So if I leaving here today, fall in the parking lot, hit my head on the sidewalk, and have bleeding into my brain, and I seize on the spot, that is not epilepsy. That is a seizure. That is a provoked seizure caused by the immediate head trauma I am suffering. If I recover, and then three months from now I have a seizure, that is an unprovoked seizure, but probably caused by my head injury. So it's the immediacy that makes it provoked. 
And we can talk more about this in the questions and answers if you like, but provoked seizures, whether you have one or five or 10, are never epilepsy. They are provoked seizures. Most of what I think we're going to talk about in our discussion are unprovoked seizures. So that's a seizure that might have a cause, but doesn't have an immediate explanation for why it happened at 12.05 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon. There's no immediate trigger, so that makes it an unprovoked seizure, even if it might have a cause, whether it be a genetic problem or head trauma or whatever the cause may be. Now, it used to be, and the way I was trained years ago, is that epilepsy was defined as two or more unprovoked seizures on separate days. So a single unprovoked seizure was just that. It was a single unprovoked seizure. It was not epilepsy. You needed two on separate days to be diagnosed with epilepsy. But about five years ago, largely led by adult neurologists, not pediatric neurologists, people started thinking about whether that was really the best definition. And so the definition of epilepsy officially across all ages has now changed. It's no longer two unprovoked seizures, but it's one unprovoked seizure, and then a risk of having a second. And they came up with, you know, they had to pick some numbers here, so they came up with this one unprovoked seizure and a 10-year recurrence risk of greater than 60%. So, so what does that mean? I mean, and how do you apply that to a patient? Okay, so I'm seeing a patient and they have had their first unprovoked seizure and there's no doubt about that. So to diagnose epilepsy, I'm supposed to look into a crystal ball and say, okay, 10 years from now, you have a 65% chance of having a second seizure. Well, that's not really, you can't do that. So, but that's the official definition. One unprovoked seizure and a 10 year risk of greater than 60% of having a second. What that means practically is, if you've had one unprovoked seizure and you have an abnormal MRI scan or you have an abnormal EEG or you have a physical exam finding that suggests a risk for seizures, then you're probably put in that higher risk category and you're diagnosed with epilepsy. So what does all this mean? What it really means is that, and I think the reason behind it was, if you're an adult, one seizure is one more than, is, is plenty. One seizure is too many, certainly in an adult. So there were some adults where a workup wasn't done and treatment wasn't initiated until the second seizure. Because a first seizure was just that, it was just a first seizure. And that probably wasn't the best approach. So now it's clear that if you have a single unprovoked seizure, uh, and you go to a physician, you should uh, have a discussion about what that means and have an evaluation, including an EEG and often an MRI scan, and then have a discussion about whether uh, this one seizure actually does reflect epilepsy. And then hopefully appropriate treatment and all the other things that come with treatment uh, happens. So, so that's now our official definition. So when does epilepsy begin? Well, it begins most commonly in infants and in senior citizens. Uh, so this bar right here, this is the age spectrum from birth to, what does that say, 80 plus. And the higher the bar, the more likely patients are to develop epilepsy at that point in their life. So notice on this, on this chart, the highest bar the highest risk, age risk, to develop epilepsy is above 80 years. Uh, because epilepsy is a common uh, condition that can come with things like Alzheimer's disease, stroke, Parkinson's disease, and other diseases of aging. On the other side here, this bar, way over here, where's my cursor, there it is, way over here, this is zero to four years of age. It's not all that high, but if this was zero to one year of age, it would be up here. It would be about as high as the senior citizen bar because the two most common ages to develop epilepsy are the first year of life and 80 and above. 
and then every age in between has its own particular risk. Notice the lowest bar is ages 45 to 49. So right in the middle of middle age is the lowest risk time to develop epilepsy. It's not zero, it can still happen, but it's low risk. So the point here is epilepsy crosses the entire age spectrum from infants to young adults, adults, senior citizens, everyone. And because of that, I think this is why people, physicians, neurologists, maybe even epilepsy experts were surprised, and you heard this in the opening talk, that epilepsy is the fourth most common neurological disease. It is surprisingly common because some patients have epilepsy their whole life, some have it for a few years in childhood. Some haven't developed it yet, but are going to develop it when they're 85 or 90. So it's this entire age spectrum disease. So that, it, it's just hard to wrap your mind around that and how you figure out how something is, is so common when it can present all throughout the age spectrum. So, but it's now clear that it is as common as the numbers say it is, and you heard this slide in the opening talk, or you heard this number, that one in 26 people will develop epilepsy at some point in their life. And this is very valuable to raise awareness and resources because this is a really common problem that I think very few people appreciate how common it is. Maybe not in this room, but, but outside this room, this is very surprising. All right, so. Now, here's our new attempt to classify seizures. So this is the simple version, and then there's a longer version that's coming in the next slide. But let me walk you through this. So the first thing we are asked as physicians to figure out in a patient with epilepsy is are the, do the seizures begin as focal onset seizures? That, that means they begin in a spot somewhere in the brain. Or do they begin as generalized onset seizures? That means they start all over the place at once or deep down in the center of the brain, which leads to an all over the place at once seizure, or you just can't tell, unknown. And I like this classification system for a lot of reasons, but one of them is this unknown. Notice that unknown has equal billing as focal and generalized. You might say, well, that doesn't sound very good. Like right, off the, right, off the, right out of the gate, you're telling us that sometimes you don't even know whether it's a focal or generalized seizure. Yes, that is correct maybe 10, 15% of the time, we do all the testing we can do, and it's clearly a seizure. It's clearly unprovoked, but we don't know whether it starts in a spot or all over the place at once. And the reason I like that is we need to do a better job in medicine of admitting when we don't know stuff. Because uh, it's not that easy to so, say, well, thank you. Welcome to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in our beautiful buildings. And uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> really? Is it? Yeah, well, you know, you, you've come here for the, the expertise, and the expertise is we don't know. We'll do our best to figure it out, but we don't know. And if we say things that are not true, that's not helping anybody out, other than it temporarily maybe makes you feel better, but that's, not, that's, that's no good. So I like the fact that unknown is their uh, equal billing. So now let's talk about focal onset seizures. And... Sometimes you know just by watching a seizure that it is definitely, no doubt about it, a focal onset seizure. And that's because one side of the body is doing something that the other side's not doing. So a, one example of a focal onset seizure would be shaking, rhythmic shaking of one side of the body. And maybe it turns into stiffening of one side of the body, but the key is one side of the body is doing something and the other side is not. So if that rhythmic shaking is, is a seizure and it's only one side of the body, then that is guaranteed this column. That is a focal onset seizure. And then the next thing we've established, just by rhythmic shaking of one side of the body, that that is motor. That is a focal motor seizure, motor meaning movement. And then the next question would be, is the patient's awareness affected or not? So focal shaking of one side of the body where I'm totally aware of what's going on and I remember and I can describe it, that is a focal aware motor seizure. That's the new way to describe that, focal aware motor. The old way was simple partial motor. 
And to me, focal means spot, aware means aware, motor means movement. That makes sense to me. Simple partial. Simple? Nothing about the brain is simple. So that was always a bad term, simple, nothing. And certainly a seizure is not simple if you're the patient having a seizure. It's not simple if you're trying to figure out why. Partial, another bad term. Partial? You mean not really a seizure, just like part of a seizure? Or not a full seizure, just like sort of a seizure? So partial was never a good term. And now those terms are gone. Uh, a simple partial seizure is a focal aware, and then either motor or non-motor, depending on whether they're shaking or not. Many focal seizures involve impairment of awareness, and that's important to know because it's a safety concern. Uh, and focal seizures may or may not involve movement, and they may or may not spread to generalized seizures. Now they took something off. There was an earlier draft of this that they removed in the final version and that part I don't like because what was on the, the early version was aware, impaired aware, or unknown aware. And I missed that because as a pediatric neurologist, tell me if your two-year-old has impaired awareness during that seizure. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, the awareness of a two-year-old, like, figure, you know, that's a hard question. So unfortunately, they removed that, but I still use it. So there are, so focal, meaning one side of the body's doing something, the other side's not. Aware, impaired aware, or you don't know, and then motor or non-motor. So that's sort of the simple way to walk through focal onset seizures. Now, generalized onset seizures, in a way, are simpler because there are fewer types of them. It's not simpler if you're the patient with them, but to try to describe them. So generalized onset seizures start all over, all over the brain at once. And again, we're asked motor or non-motor. Is there movement or not? Now the motor signs of generalized onset seizures are both sides do the same thing. If it's a generalized onset seizure, then your right side will do what your left side does. The shaking will be symmetric. The stiffening will be symmetric. The two sides are equal. A non-motor generalized seizure, they left in, they left in the French term absence because it's, it's quite a useful term. A non-motor generalized seizure both sides of the body are still doing the same thing. They're just not doing very much. Stop, stare, eye blinking. That can be a generalized seizure. Not a lot of movement, but both sides of the body do the same thing. So that's how we think about generalized onset seizures. And then unknown, you know, you, you, just, you just don't know. And the, the typical example of that would be, and this came up in our discussion in the last, in the last session, uh, you see somebody on the street who's in the midst of a seizure. How do you know if it's focal or generalized? Well, if the patient is in the midst of the seizure and you didn't see the beginning of it and both sides are shaking and stiffening, you don't know whether that started as a generalized seizure or whether it started as a focal seizure and then spread to a generalized seizure. So that would be the most common reason for not knowing whether it's a focal or generalized onset seizure. So this is the simple uh, display. Here's the longer display. We can come back to this in the discussion section if certain people have questions that, re that maybe relate to a focal motor seizure with uh, you know, clonic movement or a focal non-motor seizure with behavioral arrest. That means stop, stare. I won't go through all of these, but we can refer back to this later on uh, if, if it's helpful. All right, so we've talked about seizure types. So the other thing that happened earlier this year through the International League Against Epilepsy, that's the ILAE, is they developed this broader-based one-slide overview of epilepsy. The top part of it is what we just talked about, the seizure types. Every patient with epilepsy 
has a seizure type, even if it's unknown. Uh, then we have etiology means cause. There are six general categories for the cause of epilepsy. And I know you probably can't read the words, so I'll, I will tell you. The first cause is structural. That means there is, typically through an MRI scan, you see something different on the MRI scan of the patient's brain, and that, that structural difference, that spot on the MRI scan, is probably the cause of the seizure. It might be an injury. It might be the result of an injury. It might be the result of some brain development that didn't go in a typical way, but you can look at the MRI scan, scan and say, aha, there, that spot is probably what's causing your seizures. Second is genetic. Genetic means that you know, it's inherited. Or it means it's genetic but not inherited. So let me try to explain that. So genetic inherited means family history. Your parent had epilepsy. Siblings have epilepsy. Sort of simple, old-fashioned genetics it runs in the family. Okay, that's genetic inherited. Now we know there's genetic but not inherited because when, uh, when the baby, when, the, when, the, when the, the baby comes together, there's genes from the mother and genes from the father, and then that baby grows and grows and grows and every time they grow there's genetics and changes and cells are dividing and along the way there can be a genetic change introduced. So it's genetic because you can see it in the DNA but neither parent has it because it wasn't inherited. So genetic not inherited is harder to wrap your mind around and it requires fancy genetic testing but we can now do that for many patients. Infectious. So infectious gets its own billing, top billing, because having a brain infection in your history, meningitis, encephalitis, either bacterial or viral infection, is, is a very powerful risk factor for developing epilepsy later. And sometimes the MRI scans are normal. You don't see scars from the infection. But if there was a brain infection, that is a powerful risk factor for seizures, so it gets equal billing with these other categories. Metabolic is rare, so rare that I wish it wasn't on the list. It, they probably could have left it off, and I don't, we won't talk about it unless you have specific questions about it. The new kid on the block is immune epilepsy. And this is only maybe five, 10 years old. It's now clear that patients with no identifiable cause for their epilepsy in children and adults, it sometimes can be our own immune system turning against the brain, sparking seizures. There's a whole group of diseases like that. They fall under the category of, they're called autoimmune diseases. Uh, arthritis, lupus. An awful lot of the drug company commercials you see on TV for these long names that usually end in MAB, AB, are, tr are very expensive treatments for autoimmune diseases. Forms of arthritis or GI diseases or, or th that are caused by the immune system getting confused and causing symptoms in the, in, in, in the person. Well, seizures can be a result of that as well. It is very hard to diagnose. It is tricky to treat. Uh, and we are just beginning to try to figure that out. And then the last top billing cause is unknown. And you know, I always like it when unknown is there because still for about 50% of patients, maybe it's 40% unknown, no, no identifiable cause. All right, so you have a seizure type, you have a cause, you mix in some EEG almost always along the way, then uh, we diagnose an epilepsy type, same, same types of words, focal, generalized, mixed, or unknown. And then the other thing I wanna talk about on this slide is this sort of gray, thing that goes from top to bottom. And it uses, I think, the unfortunate word comorbidity. And notice it goes from the top to the bottom. It spans the whole thing. And this is, this is a reminder that epilepsy often comes with other stuff. It's not just about the seizures. Now, comorbidity 
means, morbidity means another medical condition that the co means comes along with it. So there's another medical condition that comes along with the epilepsy. I wish they would, they would have used the term associated condition because comorbidity sounds more morbid than it needs to be. They didn't need to use the word morbid, but they did. So associated conditions. So the most common associated conditions are learning differences and behavioral challenges like depression and anxiety. The key message here is those come along with epilepsy in many patients, but they are typically not caused by the seizures or by the treatment. They come along with the seizures or the treatment, but they are usually caused by what's ever causing the epilepsy, which might be unknown in some cases. So the reason why it's top to bottom on this is every patient with epilepsy. Uh, it's important that physicians, nurses, everybody on the care team consider these other conditions that might be there and then direct treatment as needed. All right, so treatment. Okay, great. So we've got these new words and nice slides and you know charts and all that that make sense. At least they make sense to us. So what does this mean for treatment options? Well, it hasn't fundamentally changed anything about treatment options. The treatment options remain the same. For many patients, medication is the mainstay. We have an ever-increasing uh, range of surgical options. Uh, traditionally, epilepsy surgery means find the spot, prove that it's not doing anything too important, and then remove it. That is still a common route toward epilepsy surgery, not for all patients, but for some. Now we have brain stimulation, where the brain's not removed, but the brain is stimulated to try to reduce seizures. And then we now have a wide array of dietary therapies. The dietary therapy for epilepsy is no longer limited to uh, infants, and children eating a 90% fat, very low calorie diet called the ketogenic diet. There's now a range of dietary therapies for seizures in children and adults that can work, but none of them are simple, none of them are easy, and none of them are entirely safe. Uh, so we talk about uh, a high ratio ketogenic diet, that would be 90% fat, and some calorie restriction, and then a low ratio ketogenic diet that might be only 60% fat without calorie restriction. But if you wanna eat an, a healthy, balanced diet that is 60% fat uh, and has enough carbohydrates and protein, that is not something you can just do off the internet. You need expert dietary counseling to work out and implement a safe, healthy, low ratio ketogenic diet, but it can work. Uh, and it, and it, it, is, it, it is a very good treatment option for many patients. All right, so these are the medications and we can come back to this if needed. You see, we go from 1850, uh, triple bromides. Uh, it's not up to date because brivaracetam, the latest medicine is not on it. It's very hard to keep a slide like this up to date because there's a new medicine, you know, every six months or so, but this is pretty up to date and we can refer back to it if you have questions about particular medicines. And then no uh, intro to epilepsy talk in 2017, I think is complete without an iceberg, an iceberg slide or something with it. Cause it's just a reminder that seizures are the tip of the iceberg, but these other associated conditions, including treatment side effects uh, are every bit as important as the seizures. We're, if you take, you know, all patients with epilepsy, about 75% are seizure free. So that's good, it, it, we definitely wish it could be better, but where we really fall flat are side effects. Those are underappreciated, I think, by physicians, and we don't respond as quickly as we should to annoying treatment-related side effects. Hopefully we've got our mindset uh, geared toward dangerous side effects, but annoying side effects are just that, they're annoying day in and day out, and uh, we'd like those to go away as well. So that takes work, but, but that's the goal. 
So how do you pick a treatment for epilepsy in 2017? Well, it's no different you know, before this new classification system. First of all, you start with the correct diagnosis, and that starts with you don't treat fainting with seizure medicines. Uh, fainting, or the medical term syncope, can be misdiagnosed as seizures. And if you faint, a seizure medicine will not help you. Uh, so first, make sure the diagnosis is right. Then figure out the epilepsy type, the severity of the seizures, and then you look at the medication op options and you consider all these things, uh, including uh, realistically cost and prescription plans and all of that, and you select a treatment. The first treatment is almost always a medication, as you know, and then if needed, other surgery and dietary therapy come in. Now, the goals of treatment, you know, like the quick, the quick Twitter uh, line, you know, no seizures, no side effects, that's the goal. Great, I, I agree, that's a great goal, but let's be realistic. 75% no seizures, still leaves 25% that, that need better treatment, Realistically, we don't do so well on the no side effects arm. No, no means none, zero. No dizziness, no double vision, no mood changes, nothing. No side effects from your seizure treatment. Okay, some, some patients have that, but a lot has to go right for that to happen. So I think you know, patients, caregivers, and physicians, uh, the more attention we pay to some of the subtle side effects, maybe that's a way to sort of advance, advance care in, in a simple but important way. And then the other goal of treatment is to recognize and provide help for these associated conditions. And the only way to do that, and I am very fortunate to have this both at CHOP and the University of Pennsylvania Epilepsy Center, is a team. A team of physicians, nurses, psychologists, social workers, dietitians, genetic counselors if needed, to really manage all uh, of the, the entire uh, epilepsy uh, uh, the, the, the patient or the family has. Uh, and yes, that is a hassle, and that are, those are more visits sometimes. But this is very hard for one provider to do uh, on their own, because it, there's just, it's complicated. So epilepsy care is clearly uh, a team effort. Uh, I think in general in the Philadelphia area and eastern Pennsylvania, we're more fortunate than many parts of the country uh, that don't have the kind of epilepsy care teams we have in both adult and pediatric. But clearly we need to do better on all of those fronts. All right, so all th this is a, a general uh, outline for discussion. Really, I want to talk about anything you guys want to talk about. Uh, but sometimes in past uh, uh, exchanges, we have focused on some questions like this or topics like this, but uh, uh, really uh, uh, the floor is open for anything you guys want to talk about. Uh, PTSD cannot cause epilepsy. Uh, PTSD can cause other, other things that look like seizures that are not typical seizures, but the reverse is true. Uh, and I, this, I learned this a couple years ago in the Lehigh Valley version of this epilepsy exchange. Um, having epilepsy or having a family member with epilepsy can be so traumatic that it, that can lead to symptoms that resemble PTSD like flashbacks and the inability to forget a, a, a awful thing you witnessed. But PTSD won't cause uh, epilepsy seizures. Yes. The, the most straightforward way to, to sort of sort it out for both family members, patients, and care providers is the associated condition was, was already there before the seizure started. There, was, there already was developmental delay or there already were uh, learning differences or something like that, and then the seizures come later. When the seizures come first and then the other things manifest, it's totally reasonable to say, well, the seizures must have caused these other things. But when we really look at it, much, 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 much more common, those other symptoms, whether it be developmental or learning problems, 
are caused by whatever's causing the seizure. And there are, for anything in epilepsy, there are always exceptions. For the, there, so you can have patients that have seizures that are so frequent, so relentless, that the seizures drag, drags down the patient's development. That's really, really rare. It can happen, but it's rare. And the other thing is medication side effects. So, so the example I gave in, in the last group, and this is a very common scenario in my practice, a child, a school-aged child develops epilepsy. And they're started, and treatment is started. And then a couple months later, signs of uh, attention deficit disorder appear. Well, that's a no-brainer. The medicine's causing the ADD. Doc, fix it. Switch the medicine. The medicine's causing the ADD. Except that we know that kids with epilepsy have a much higher risk of ADD, whether they're treated or not, and the two present about the same age. So then, okay, we say, all right, well, I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure it's the medicine. Doc, I'm telling you, this didn't exist before. So, okay, we'll switch the medicine. And then four medicines later, the ADD is still there. That's an example of an associated condition where the, the easy answer is the seizures cause this or the treatment caused this. But the more complex but often, I think, accurate answer is no, it's part of the condition, part of the cause but it's not as direct as seizures cause learning issues or inattention or whatever the situation is. So this is a, it's a more, it's a clearer, and uh, it's not up to me to, 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 uh, to tell what's satisfying or not, but it's a clear discussion. If, if there's a clear cause, like, like let's say the cause of the epilepsy is a, a birth defect of the brain which is a common cause of pediatric seizures. Now, the part of the brain just didn't form normally. Okay, and you can see that on the MRI scan. You can show it to the family, which is never good news, but it's, it's news, it's not good news. All right, this part of the brain didn't form normally. All right, that makes sense that there are seizures and there are developmental and there are learning problems. So let's go down to the bottom here, unknown. MRI is normal. But you have seizures, developmental problems, and learning problems. It's the same thing. It's, it's just the cause is unknown, but that unknown cause is causing all three. Now, you can tell this is not, you know, not the most satisfying exchange, whether it's you know, in an office visit or in a room like this, but that's kind of the sort of the mystery behind that. You know, I think the key is to, um, to not... And, and, and where, this can, where this can impact treatment is um, one medication switch after another to fix the problem that might be caused by the medicine that's probably not. So, you know, give it, okay, we're going to, you're, you're, you're worried that, you know, the patient's worried that their seizure medicine is causing, okay, that's, you, you may be right, let's switch. But five switches later, if the same issue's still there, then maybe it's a separate issue and maybe it's not the medicine or not the seizures. So that, that's, I think that's the way to approach it. The genetic but not inherited, maybe, the, maybe one way to try to wrap your mind around this is when, when the sperm and the egg come together, that is not the end of that baby's genetics. That, that's the end of what they're inheriting. They get chromosomes from mom, chromosomes from dad, but every time, and this is especially true early, you know, when, when fetus, when, you know, fetuses are forming, every time that baby grows you know, you know, inside the mother, there are genetic changes that could happen. And any one of those could lead to a, uh, so now poof, now a genetic difference has now been introduced into that, into that baby. That's not inherited because their parents don't have it, but now it's in the baby's genes. Um, so that's that, that, that's maybe another way to to to, to think about that. Uh, yes, yes, great question. So then, if the baby then has that genetic difference, then they will pass it on. 
Yes. Um, yes. So, so Grand, Grand Mall would be, Grand Mall is tonic-clonic. Okay. A general, generalized tonic-clonic is, is, is Grand Mall. Uh, yeah, the Grand Mall is an old term that, that, that won't go away. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a French term that means big bad, <laughs> a, a, as opposed to petite mall, which means little bad. Right. And petite mall are absence staring spell seizures, and Grand Mall big bad are tonic clonic. Okay. And tonic clonic, tonic means stiff. Right. So first of all, general, generalized means both sides okay. equal, stiff. And clonic means shaking. Okay. So both sides, stiff shaking, is generalized tonic clonic or grand mal. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's certain terms that just won't 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 leave the vocabulary, and that you know that's uh, that, that's one of them. But that that's what it means. Okay. I think that the, the first thing to do with 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 trouble concentrating there. There are very reliable, simple uh, rating scales for attention that teachers fill out and parents fill out. And, and the way the diagnosis of, of attentional problems or inattention or ADD is made, and this, this, this sounds pretty simple, but that is, are these simple rating scales. So that's one approach. And if, if attention deficit or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is present on those, on those scales, then it rings true to the parents and then that's a diagnosis that can be treated either with educational uh, interventions or medication. Now, with epilepsy, patients with epilepsy, sometimes neuropsychological testing is useful because patients with epilepsy are uh, famous for having very unique learning styles where they have areas of real strength and, layer, and areas that are not so strong, and they don't typically fit a cookie cutter profile. So that's where the neuropsychological testing can come in. So short answer is you don't need neuropsychological testing to diagnose ADD or ADHD. It's simpler than that. But many patients with epilepsy benefit from neuropsychological testing because it gets not so much at their ADD, but at their other learn, at their, their learning style. You know, you say learning disability, that's not fair because some of them are brilliant, extra sharp in some areas. So learning differences or learning style is the key behind neuropsychological testing. Uh, did you say lip smacking? Yeah, I do lip smacking, right. staring, laughing. All right, so lip smacking is called an automatism. It's a, and that means autom it's, a, it's kind of a, an automatic behavior, an automatic movement. Staring is behavioral arrest. And did you say? Laughing is how they've been starting off in the last few years. I started All right. off with this hysterical laugh. All right. So that, you see under non-motor, there's also emotional. Emotional. Yeah. Ah. Um, now, l l laughing actually has a whole nother, there's a whole nother subcategory of laughing for seizures. But, but yeah, so the old term was complex partial seizure, and now it would be, Focal impaired aware, and then there, and motor because of the automatisms. Okay. Uh, there, there's also non-motor symptoms, but you don't. You can you can say both. You could say focal impaired motor and non-motor, but if motor is present, that that uh, that sort of trumps the non-motor. So motor could include staring. Well, uh, if it's Why, just. If it's just staring, it would be focal, impaired, aware, non-motor behavior arrest. <clears throat> uh, so, um, so the, like the the, uh, I think the benefit of this would be if we, it it helps us once we get used to this, and once physicians and nurse practitioners and everyone gets used to this, the, I think we can talk to each other more clearly. Uh, because, like, right away, you told me we connected with this, and if, if any of the other uh, nurses or physicians here, we would, we would be able to talk and understand uh, what you're saying and, and classify this simply, rather than complex partial. What does that mean? Yeah. There is a third type 
There's, there's, there's provoked, there's unprovoked, and then there's what's called reflex yes. seizures. And that's so, why I saw yes. Lines. So, yeah. okay. in the the most mysterious, in turn, just to try to wrap your mind around, the most mysterious seizures are reflex seizures. They they are considered unprovoked. Okay. If if you had to force, if you had to force it, okay, a reflex seizure. And reflex can be music, it can be other sounds, it can be uh, uh, hot water, uh, it can be flashing lights. I, wait, I'm thinking, wait, there's a comment, like flashing lights is a reflex seizure. Uh, those, are, you either call them reflex seizures, a third category, but they're not considered, you, you, again, you, you, be, so you go back to Yes, <laughs> yes. So they, they're provoked, but they're not provoked because they're called reflex yes. seizures. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, um, the classification wizards are going to put together, uh, uh, basically what you're, what you're asking for are synonyms, a, 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 a thesaurus, uh, a glossary, if you will. Yes, that is in development right now, where you'll be able to map the, you know, the old, old terms to the to the 10-year-old terms, to the three-year-old terms, to these. So the, the, the important point you bring up is this classification is all about onset, how things start. Um, you could imagine a, a different chart of seizure severity, which is not so much how it starts, but like, where does it end up? Uh, but this is about onset. Because that is, so uh, uh, search for a cause in treatment typically hinges on the onset, not the end uh, result of the seizure. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much.